Okay. Thank you very much, Eric, for inviting me and for organizing this summer school. I was planning to visit uh, Leiden after nearly 20 years, and I was looking forward to meeting people, but unfortunately, <laughs> we are forced to work this way and, and we'll, we'll improvise. And this talk is meant to be much longer, so I'll try to squeeze what I initially wanted to uh, talk about. So today will be more on, on theoretical issues on the concept of grounded nationalism, uh, and tomorrow I'll uh, I try to focus a little bit more on, on specific uh, historical cases of Ireland and the Balkans. So before I start, I think it's it's important that I define nationalism because there are obviously many different uh, uh, interpretations of what nationalism is and different definitions. And I define nationalism as an ideology that posits the nation as a principal unit of human solidarity and political legitimacy. So it's a kind of broad broad definition but it tries to capture uh, you know, how nationalism differs from other ideologies and also from other forms of political legitimacy that have dom dominated uh, history uh, in terms of, let's say, empires and patrimonial kingdoms and things like that. But nationalism is, is much more than that. In a sense, uh, it is a, also a meta-ideology. It's, it's a particular way of understanding the world, uh, conceptualizing the world, uh, thinking about the world, looking at the people, seeing the world. So in that sense, it's become a, something like a Bourdieuian doxa, you know, in a sense, sort of a embedded experience. Uh, and it's become naturalized. We often assume that people should have a nations, that everybody has is, is a member of some nation. So you can have more than one, you can have more than one passport, but the assumption is that, uh, you know, you cannot say I have no nation. Uh, because we live in a world that is very much nation-centric and expects us to reproduce that kind of nation-centricity. So uh, over the last uh, few hundred years, as you know, in, uh, uh, from this uh, uh, course, uh, nations have gradually developed and established themselves, have become almost natural and self-evident, but they are not natural and self-evident. So in a sense, uh, what I'd like to do is to look a little bit at this historical transformation of, of nationalism. And uh, before that, it's important also to emphasize that uh, we often, particularly in more recent times, tend to look at nationalism as a as a something that uh, is associated only with the far-right uh, politics. Uh, although, as we know, nationalism can be left-wing as well and centrist and all sorts of other nationalisms. Uh, but I think we, we should move away from there in order to understand how nationalism can become radicalized. And in order to, uh, for us to, to understand that, we have to look at trajectory, historical trajectory of, of nationalism. So in that context, I see nationalism as a principal mode of subjectivity in modernity. So in the last 200, 250 years, something has changed profoundly that na nationhood has, has become so embedded that we take it for granted and we don't question it. Uh, uh, we uh, reproduce these assumptions, uh, even when we try to criticize them, we still often tend to work within these categories that are already given to us. So that's why I see nationalism as a dominant operative ideology of modernity. That means that, I mean, just to give an example, if you look at the states in the world, very different states like North Korea and Iran and United States and Russia, they are politically, uh, you know, uh, uh, associated with very different regimes. You know, some are uh, theo theocracies like Iran, some are communist states in uh, North Korea, some are nominally liberal democracies like United States, but they're all on operative level grounded in some form of nationalism. And, and the rulers are always involved that, that they represent particular people, Iranian people, Korean people, American people. So in that sense, nationalism uh, is very much uh, 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 much stronger. That's why I say it's a meta ideology. It's much stronger than, uh, than any other ideology. It can work with other ideologies. It's malleable, it's plastic. It kind of uh, envelops other ideologies uh, and uh, reproduces itself regardless of whether you come from political left or political right or center or anything in between. So it is important for us to understand why nationalism has such a potency. I think one of the key reasons for this is the organizational structure uh, that reproduces nationalism. And that's the polity that dominates in the world that we live in today, and that's nation state. So nation state uh, has been gradually becoming a dominant and hegemonic form of social organization. Uh, we could say, obviously, in, in historical terms, after the French and American revolutions and uh, wars of independence in Latin America, all of these were kind of starting points for uh, gradual transformation from imperial uh, 
to national forms of uh, organization, but they were, they were just a, a starting point rather than finishing point. And I'll talk a little bit about this more tomorrow, you know, the similarities between empires and nation states, especially in that early period. Uh, but uh, nation states have become really hegemonic and dominant only after the Second World War. Uh, from then on, we see that all other forms of political organization, territorial political organization, such as empires, patrimonial kingdoms, cities, states, uh, khanates, sultanates, anything you can think of, become completely delegitimized. So today in the world, uh, you know, no state uh, would claim to be an empire. We can talk about informal empires, uh, but in reality, Japan is the only state which nominally is still an empire, but in reality, it's really not. The way how it's organized, it is organized as another nation state. Uh, UN is also set up very much on that principle that uh, there is no higher power beyond the sovereignty of nation state. So nation state is considered to be the only legitimate uh, form of uh, ter territorial or political rule. So that's important because that shapes everything, what's inside the nation states, that shapes the ideological uh, uh, content of, of, of nationalism. Uh, uh, it's it, it also important, and I think I, I, I emphasize that in the book that Eric mentioned, um, nation states and nationalisms, we, we tend to see nationalism in nation states as, as given as normal and natural, maybe not necessarily the scholars, as scholars we always question things, but most people do. Uh, but if we look historically, uh, we, we'll see how, how recent nation state is as, as a political uh, organization. So even if we uh, discount uh, 200,000 years of our existence on this planet as hunter-gatherers and focus only on the sedentary period, which is about 10 to 12,000 years of, of uh, human existence on this planet, nation states count for less than 2%. So they're really a blip in a historical ocean. Uh, but once they, they came into existence, they become, it's like a parasite, you know, <laughs> they've taken over completely and, and have become so dominant that even entities which are really city states like Singapore or Liechtenstein have, have now uh, framed themselves as nation states. Uh, uh, so that tells us a lot about the world that we live in. So in a modern world, we are all born in nation states. Uh, they are not the same. They're obviously not the same in terms of size and strength and uh, capacity, infrastructural capacity, but they are all recognized as such. So we are born in nation states, we are raised in educational institutions uh, that are very much uh, shaped uh, by, by the nation states. Even if you go to private education, you know, you have to work with the programs that are or, uh, set up and approved by the states. Uh, we have, we are employed by nation states. Again, we can work in the private sector, but again, there are rules how private or, uh, corporations have to work uh, uh, and we are also part of the national project in that way. Our welfare provisions are secured through nation states. Uh, so in that sense, when people say, uh, when we talk about national identities, the assumption is that this is a matter of somebody's choice. You know, I feel this way, I feel Dutch, I feel German or Irish. But uh, we don't really look at, at the structural context where this uh, statement is made. So in a sense, national identities have less to do with, with the personal choice and much more with the structural context where we find ourselves. So we are already born in, in, in this world of nation states. So it's very difficult to not to uh, be a, a Dutch or French or whatever, uh, because the options are limited. Uh, you can only be a member of a particular nation. You cannot say I'm a, I'm a member of this particular tribe or I'm a, I, I, I'm a member of this empire because these entities are not available anymore to us. So in a sense, uh, nation states shape a lot of, of, of that sense of identification as well. Uh, so when we study nationalism, uh, it's, uh, we, we have to treat it and approach it not as some sort of a, a temporary aberration, historical aberration that appears, you know, suddenly from nowhere. Where's this? Why is this Trump coming suddenly? Why Brexit? Why are these things? So as a, as a historical sociologist and historians, we have to look at the long durée, uh, you know, as as way how nation states and nationalism have developed over really long periods of time. Uh, so in that context, uh, nationalism is very uh, durable, very uh, powerful, precisely because it's it's plastic, it's malleable, it's flexible. It it can accommodate different uh, belief systems, uh, and it it, it, it can uh, become radicalized. It, it can become muted uh, and, and, and it appears in so many different forms. So in, in the, in the uh, theories of nationalism, we often operate with lots of different dichotomies. And I think uh, 
three dichotomies that I'd like to, to identify have been dominating the discussion. One is a distinction between the hot and banal nationalism. One, the other one is a civic versus ethnic nationalism. And the third is pre-modern and modern about dating uh, nations and nationalism. So what I do, and this will kind of now lead me to the grounded nationalism approach, I try to go beyond these three, three dichotomies. I try to see and explain how they are not particularly helpful in understanding development of nationalism. Uh, so I think it's, uh, if we focus very briefly on, on, on each of these three, uh, you know, often nationalism uh, has, the, the traditional assumption was that nationalism is something is violent and aggressive, uh, and it's associated with revolutions and war and disorder and violence, and obviously some nationalisms are like that. And, you know, now the images that we are all familiar with are obviously Nazi Germany and fascism in uh, Italy and Japan and other places. But then we have a more leftic, leftist version of anti-colonial nationalism from the 50s and 60s, which seem to be quite different uh, uh, species, or it is presented as a very different species. Then again, in the 1990s, we see again very aggressive ethnic forms of nationalism in, in breakup of Yugoslavia and in, in genocide in Rwanda and uh, Caucasus and other places. And now more recently, again, we see uh, another another species of populist nationalism and also white, white nationalism, terrorist version of it. Uh, so that, that kind of uh, uh, traditional association always tended to see nationalism as, as, as a violent, inevitably violent. More recently, you know, since Billig's work on, on banal nationalism and more recent work on everyday nationalism by uh, a, a number of people who Fox and, and others and, and Eric has done work on this as well in a historical context. Uh, the focus has been largely on, on kind of this habitual reproduction of nation centric uh, imageries in sport, in cuisine, in international beauty pageants, in, in uh, tourist, uh, you know, experiences and things like that. Uh, what's problematic is uh, keeping these distinctions as completely separate, as if violent nationalism and banal nationalism are two different uh, uh, species. So what I try to do uh, in this book is to, to question that, uh, you know, by looking at the way how nationalism transforms, you know, arguing essentially this is the same phenomenon, that much of nationalism really is every day, it's habitual, uh, and it's really at, at particular moments in time that it becomes uh, uh, more radicalized and eventually uh, becomes violent as well. Because uh, uh, violence is often associated with uh, intense emotional experiences. And we know from Durkheim, you know, that this notion of collective effervescence is something that uh, cannot last for a very long time. You know, it, it is intense. You know, people in, in a, if you if you think of a riot uh, or some you know more recent events that we've seen with the when people congregate together and you know uh, do something actively destroy something that cannot really last a very long time. So so in that sense, emotional outbursts are, are, are rare and and cannot last. Uh, so much of our our social actions tend to be uh, uh, habitual. You know kind of everyday activities that we don't think about, in a sense, what, what banal nationalism is about. So what's interesting is really to look at how we move from this habitual into the violent one. Uh, the problem with some of the banal nationalism literature tends to focus really on, you know, more recent things. Uh, and particularly if you look at the uh, scholarship from, from the beginning of, the, of the, this century, it tended to assume that, you know, violent nationalism is something that was happening in uh, 19th century and, and the World War II, and now we've entered this phase of banal nationalism, that's it. And then everybody's surprised when, you know, nationalism becomes again violent and, and aggressive. So uh, uh, the, the point is not to differentiate in terms of time. The point is to argue that all nationalisms are predominantly habitual. Uh, I think Eric does that to some extent in, in his work as well. And then look at how these transformations happen, in, in, you know, depending on specific context and things like that. The second dichotomy is the civic versus ethnic, which I won't spend much time on already, I think, <laughs> not moving quickly enough as I should be. Uh, you know, traditionally, uh, a nationalism, well, you know, nationalism scholarship, it was very clear. Ethnic nationalism is uh, something associated with descent and heredity and uh, biology and, and uh, language in some instances. And this was assumed to be uh, something happening in, in, in Central and Eastern Europe. And then 
We have the uh, civic nationalism associated with Western uh, Europe and the United States, particularly in France and so on, which is seen to uh, have something to do with the allegiance to specific uh, constitutional order or shared political rights. Uh, that's the Habermasian idea of constitutional patriotism. But then again, as we know, history is messy and it's not easy to draw these lines. And a lot of uh, more recent scholarships has questioned this dichotomy, is arguing that this is a really uh, variable that can happen, that every nationalism has elements of both. And, and we see that, you know, precisely with the case of Britain and the United States, which are often previously seen as examples of civic nationalism. And now we see, you know, dominance of these ethnic discourses and white uh, uh, nationalism in the United States and, and things like that. Uh, so uh, this, this distinction has to be, we have to go to, go, uh, to question this distinction. And I think the focus should really be on looking historically how nationalisms oscillate, you know, how some, at some moments in times, ethnic, so-called ethnic nationalism can be more inclusive than the so-called civic nationalisms and vice versa. Uh, so, so the point is looking at this, this degree of inclusivity, exclusivity, uh, uh, which, which goes uh, and is shaped by so many different historical factors. And the third category is the, the pre-modern versus modern. Here again, is an ongoing big debate of whether nationalisms are, are traditional or, or primordial or, or uh, uh, you know, ethno-symbolists and uh, Smith and, and Hutchinson and others make that case that you're familiar with, with the cultural, cultural continuity of uh, uh, ethnic and ethnic origins of nations. And then modernists argue that this is a co completely modern phenomenon dependent on industrialization, urbanization, and so on. So I won't go into that. You're familiar with this debate anyway. So what I want to, to argue is that we should question this as well, uh, because it, you know, these are not fixed, pre-given things. You, it, I'm, 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 a, I'm a modernist in many respects, but I'm, I'm a modernist with a twist. I try to so, sort of to see, to understand uh, you know, that we don't really start from scratch in, in 19th century. We build on something, uh, but we have to see and explore how, wh wh what, what is that that has played uh, a, a particular role in, in that some nationalisms have emerged in the 19th century or you know, in 20th centuries and others have not. So that's what grounded nationalism really is about. And uh, I will just very briefly go through this now because I don't have that much time. Uh, what I mean by grounded nationalism. So. Uh, nationalism uh, is, has historically been uh, often interpreted as, as a political ideology that emerges in the, in the largely in the 19th century. I mean, it has intellectual roots before in Enlightenment and Romanticism that you're all uh, familiar with. Uh, but more recently, uh, you know, historical sociologists and, and, and historians have, uh, some historians have uh, emphasized more kind of this uh, mass, mass level experience uh, and and then nationalism becomes much more a phenom phenomenon of the 20th century in 21st century than 19th century because in the 19th century we are really talking about small groups of people elite, elites cultural political economic uh, but uh, if you want to talk about nationalism as, as a large-scale sociological uh, phenomenon then uh, uh, after the second world war we see how nationalism proliferates dramatically uh, throughout the globe you know, all these things that I was talking about initially, how it replaces imperial patrimonial kingdoms and other forms of social order. So we have to look at uh, what's happening with nationalism in that context. And I, I argue that nationalism is historically grounded, it's uh, 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 organizationally grounded, it's ideologically grounded, and it's micro-interactionally -inter grounded. So I'll do this very quickly, and most of you have read this uh, introduction from the book where, where I kind of summarize these points quickly and then in the book I developed them in diff different empirical uh, cases. Um, nationalism is historically grounded essentially means that uh, uh, once it develops uh, it becomes uh, quite uh, strong, sturdy and durable and intends to expand uh, both vertically and horizontally which means uh, it, it is a uh, it, uh, particularly in European context, because we know much more about European context, it starts off as, as, uh, as, as uh, uh, from the top of minority, uh, you know, cultural elites and political elites, and then gradually incorporates different social strata, middle classes, and then eventually urban poor and, and uh, peasants, uh, farmers. So it does operate that way. It's, it's not solely top down, but that is uh, very much how it, it started. Uh, and that's the uh, uh, one way, a vertical process. But it also, nationalist practices uh, 
diffuse are diffused not only within the particular uh, polities but also throughout the globe. So colonialism has contributed paradoxically very much to the spread of nationalism and, and the rise of, of anti-colonial movements, nationalist movements had to do with people being educated in, in some European centers and then borrowing some of these ideas uh, to fight the, the, the imperial uh, dominance. So in a sense, that's also important. And that kind of has created this situation now that all uh, states in the world uh, use this uh, a, a political legitimacy of nationhood as, as the dominant one. Uh, so in, in this context, nationalism and nationalist ideas were constantly uh, developed, changed, uh, uh, formulated to attract diverse social groups. Uh, that's why we have, a, let's say, initially in the, in the uh, uh, mid-19th century, nationalism tends to be aligned with, with uh, uh, some progressive causes, including liberals and socialists and feminists and anarchists and republicans and secularists. And then by the end of the uh, 19th century, early 20th century, it moves, shifts very much to politically to the right. And it's, it's combined with imperialism, uh, in, in colonialism, monarchism, fascism, eugenics, racism, and then again switches back. And I've talked about this, you know, in the 50s, 60s and so on. Uh, so, so here we see this historical dynamic of nationalism, how it, it uh, develops and expands and becomes grounded. Uh, in, in, internally and, and also throughout the globe. Secondly, nationalism is also organizationally grounded, which means that it's, uh, it relies on existence of specific social organizations. Uh, you know, what I mean by this is if you think of, of a, you know, Catholic uh, uh, religion wouldn't exist and uh, wouldn't be so influential and have more than a billion uh, followers if it wasn't for the existence of Catholic Church. So it is an institution, it's an organizational structure that was crucial in spreading this and maintaining and keeping uh, followers, uh, you know, expanding them. So the same is with nationalism. It requires some organizational ve vessels, you know, some structure. Uh, and we, we can, you know, scholars of, of 19th century nationalism have focused extensively on the secret societies, uh, revolutionary societies like Italy and uh, you know, all sorts of uh, uh, carbonaras and, and all, all these uh, uh, secret groups, uh, Turkish Committee of Union and Progress. All of these were important because you had a very disciplined, small group of individuals who wanted to achieve something and had a, you know, organizational basis for that, although that was not sufficient yet. Then we have larger social movements. Uh, you know, this is again, 19, uh, early 20th century. And I give examples of Irish nationalism, uh, why it was crucial to have a organizational uh, 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 structure in place, such as the Gaelic League or uh, uh, GAA, the uh, Gaelic Athletic Association, which is still very, very strong in Irish context, for example, because it was able to uh, spread throughout the whole country in, in small parishes, also often linked with the church, it allowed you know, penetration of, of nationalism through organizational cells. Uh, then nationalism, most of all, it really uh, uh, is reliant on, on the state structures. So once you have a state, once you, then you have organizational capacities of the states, and that's, that's, that keeps nationalism alive and strong. Uh, and that uh, means, you know, administrative, administrative uh, 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 bureaucracy, essentially uh, a judiciary, uh, military police, all of these are important for controlling population, for kind of uh, fostering certain belief systems and pushing them through. Uh, and it's also important that these coercive organizations uh, uh, contribute to building uh, uniform institutions in place and help mo homogenize populations. So often this, as you know, for example, in French case, this was a very coercive process. You know, this is what French revolutionaries always wanted to do from the very beginning. You know, we all sh should be the same. You know, you, no, you cannot speak Breton. Breton is against the revolution. We, everybody has to speak French. French is the language of the revolution. French is the language of freedom. So state was important. St states are still important. They're crucial in molding population in that respect. But also civil society groups as well. Religious organizations, private corporations, NGOs, uh, 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 lots of these things uh, which I don't have time to go, go into. Uh, so that's the second thing, which, which defines groundedness of, groundedness of nationalism, organizational capacity. Third element is ideological. Nationalism is ideologically grounded, which means that it 
it has to have certain uh, ideological uh, blueprints that it offers to those who will subscribe to that belief system. So it has to de- have these grand uh, vistas of liberation, uh, emancipation, belonging, unification that, that might appeal to some audience. So that's why nationalism is often uh, 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 grounded in these kind of ethical principles of you know, invoking notions of liberty, justice, equality, fraternity, uh, and it posits nation state as a pinnacle of this progress. So it's a teleological uh, ideology in a sense, as all ideologies are ultimately. So, so in a sense, having a nation state and fighting for a nation state is the ultimate, ultimate goal, ultimate ambition. Uh, so, so nationalist messages are often framed in the, in the discourse of righteousness. Uh, you know, they all emphasize oppression of the, of the foreigners and, you know, uh, sacrifices made by one's co-nationals. Uh, and you, you, you'll find, obviously, all, in all nationalist literature, many of these speeches made by politicians and poets and, and all sorts of figures who invoke this sense of moral justice. We need a state of our own. Uh, people need to be represented and we need to be unified and things like that. Uh, but what's also important for ideology, uh, ideological penetration is this link with organizational grounding. So in a sense, uh, having high literacy rates as Gellner and Anderson have, have you know, showed is very important. It's very difficult to have a nationally uh, conscious, if you like, populations, which is completely literate, you need a high degree of literacy. You need standardized languages, you need standardized educational systems, you need uh, accessible uh, uh, books, and more recently, obviously, uh, internet and social media also contribute to framing and shaping and reproducing nation-centric discourses. Uh, so all of these things contribute you know, to ideological grounding. And, and finally, uh, it's the, I'll finish with this, is that nationalism also depends on the micro-interactional grounding. So uh, uh, organizations and ideologies are very important, but they are not enough. You need something, uh, they're, they're big, powerful structures, but you also need agency. You know, an agency is very important in the way how we interact with people who matter to us in a, in a face-to-face interaction. Uh, and this is how nationalism penetrates uh, everyday life. So uh, this is how nationalism is reproduced habitually. So the, all these things that I was talking about in the beginning are very important for uh, understanding this dynamic between organizational grounding, ideological grounding, and this micro-interactional grounding face-to-face inter- uh, grounding. Uh, so we know from scholarships on everyday nationalism that uh, nation, uh, nationhood is discursively constructed through routine talk, you know, how we frame, you know, Billig talks about we, you know, in the newspapers and everywhere when we uh, the, the frame nation as, as, as something that is taken as for granted, as, you know, assumption that we are part of the nation, we speak for the nation. Rituals, everyday rituals are important, everyday consumption, uh, you know, national symbols and, and products, all of these things, you know, that uh, Antonich and, and, and Fox and other people uh, have analyzed and, and Eric as well. Uh, so, so in that sense, uh, it is important to look at these micro level uh, 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 interactions and particularly the role of emotions in this process, you know, how we uh, frame uh, our personal uh, uh, discussions and uh, people that matter to us. So these micro emotional attachments uh, uh, are important in, in kind of shaping the meanings because hu- human beings are meaning-oriented creatures. Uh, so we need to situate uh, all these big narratives into the micro micro uh, stories. Uh, uh, and nationalist messages... Uh, 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 allow us to do that. You know, in, in a sense, they speak in the language of uh, kinship and friendship. Uh, it's not a coincidence that all nationalisms borrow kinship terms. You know, Mother Russia and we, the brothers and sisters of the nation. And, uh, you know, so these kinship metaphors resonate uh, because uh, for most human beings, you know, kinship and friendships are important. So uh, all ideologies try to to frame themselves, frame their discourses in that sense of uh, uh, kinship and friendship uh, or comradeship, all these kind of close face-to-face uh, networks. 
um, and they invoke that sense of morality and emotional emotional responsibility. So the key uh, I- issue for the success of nationalism is ability to couch the, the, this nationalist narrative into this uh, micro story, uh, you know, projecting this micro solidarity uh, and, and uh, working with them. Uh, so you have this national canvas, you know, the nationalist stories here and people have to recognize their own personal stories in this big story uh, to, to see that I'm part of this, you know, I feel Dutch or French or German or Irish or whoever. So ideology of nationalism aims to translate this, this, this sense of attachment, the, the warmth that we get in these interpersonal uh, networks into these giant national national identities, whatever. Uh, so what's important for us is to look at this, you know, the dynamics between these different processes, how, uh, you know, organization, how, first of all, historical grounding uh, provides uh, a, a, a structure for this, this ongoing process, and then why we need a, a organizational grounding and how organizational grounding is linked is with ideological grounding, and ultimately how both of these uh, find themselves into this, this kind of inter inter uh, personal inter interactional domain uh, to contribute to development of, of grounded nationalism. So I'll stop here now. I've, I've run through this bit too quickly, uh, but we will we will have a, you know discussion and debate, and then I can also elaborate a little bit more and maybe give some examples as well. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sinisa. Um, so um, I think we have a, a break of well, slightly more than five minutes. So okay. until quarter to four, and mm-hmm. I would encourage everybody to write down uh, their questions in the chat on the right side of your um, screen. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, if Sinisa has already time, he can take a look at the questions that are already there. I think mine is the first one. So. Uh, mm-hmm. And then, um, yeah, I just go to the chat, chat, isn't it? Now, yeah. And um, then um, uh, the students from the summer school have prepared some questions. So uh, um, if there are not many questions in the chat, we can uh, continue with uh, the students, the, the questions prepared by the students. Okay, so uh, a short break until a quarter to uh, four. Okay, thanks. Okay. Maybe people can put on the camera so we can 